We're going to be concluding the Sermon on the Mount today, Matthew chapter 7. I think it is extremely relevant to our day. There's been much discussion among scholars about the unity of this chapter. It seems to me in the concluding of this sermon that Jesus talks about two inappropriate and diametrically opposite responses that uh, people usually do in the area of religion. He's going to talk about the overzealous self-righteous, and he's going to talk about the fake righteous. And the, the words are so penetrating and so relevant to every generation of Christians for all of us struggle with those who are so sincere but so ugly toward others. Oh, my brothers and sisters, some of the ugliest, most critical, most judgmental people I have ever met have been conservative Christians. It should not be so. I, but, you know, I've heard this passage abused so much by saying, don't judge me, don't judge me. Uh, Jesus himself is going to say in verse 6, you've got, we've got to judge. It's not that we can't make a valid critique of other people. We have to do that. It's that we can't make a self-righteous, judgmental critique, looking down our spiritual noses at everybody who's not in our club and nobody's in it but us. And there's another danger. Those who look so sharp, act so religious, talk so logical, and yet they're wolves in sheep's clothing. God help us, we've got false teachers with us that are leading God's people down paths of destruction. We've got those kind of folks. This chapter is going to be very, very relevant to our lives. Stop criticizing. Now, this is a present imperative with a May article, which means stop and act already in process. Even at this early period, uh, people were acting self-righteous. And I'm sure this particularly refers to the Pharisees and Sadducees, but I think it also refers to some of Jesus' disciples who have this same spirit we're going to see. Now, the word criticizing, we get the English word critic from the Greek word. Kreno is the Greek word to judge. This is the word stop judging one another, brothers. Now, this thing is paralleled in all the other Gospels, Luke 6, 36 and 38, and verses 41 and 42. Uh, it's, it starts with a more positive, uh, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. And here it's stop criticizing so that you may not be criticizing yourselves. Look at verse 2. Now, verse 2 in Greek is very rhythmic, has a lot of rhyme in it. Most of us think it's a proverb uh, that was uh, said quite often in the culture. That's why it's used in several different contexts in the Bible. And you might want to see some of these other contexts uh, for this idea about, for exactly as you criticize others, it'll be criticized, you will be criticized. In accordance with the measure you give to others, it'll be measured back to you. Well, I guess one of the strongest things of this in the Sermon on the Mount, you ought to look back at Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Oh, you ought to look at Matthew chapter 6. The, the, the sentence after the Lord's Prayer is devastating. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Uh, the parable about the judge in Matthew 18, 35. Mark eleven twenty five, And then two penetrating comments in the book of James. James 2, 13 and James 5, 9. Do you mean that as we act to others is the way God's going to act toward us? Yes. Does that mean that we're out of the area of grace and in the area of works? No. No, it doesn't. Now, notice where it mentions here. Why do you keep watching the tiny speck in your brother's eye? Now, the Greek words here was used by the class classical Greek authors to mean the material that made up a bird nest. So a piece of straw, a little piece of string, a little piece of wood, okay? The speck in your brother's eye, but pay no attention to the girder. Uh, maybe in our society, the, the, the railroad tie in your own. Now, this is, this is oriental overstatement, oriental exaggeration. We see this same kind of overstatement in Matthew 5, 29 and 30, Matthew 19, 24, Matthew 23, 24. Jesus used oriental overstatement to make his point. 
But here comes a pious person up and says, with a log sticking out of his eye, let me help you get the speck out of your eye, brother. Well, that, that would be ludicrous. So is judgmentalness on the part of Christians who pick certain sins to pick at while their lives are full of other sins. One of the worst is religious self-righteousness, which we're in the church are uniquely prone to, especially in the atmosphere of modern denominational arrogance. How can you say to your brother, let me get the speck out of your eye while all the time there is a girder in your own eye? You hypocrite. Now, the word hypocrite is a combination of that same word to judge, crino, and it means to judge under. A judge under is the literal word for hypocrite, to judge under a mask. It, it comes from the theatrical world. Remember those masks they used to have in plays where one is smiling and one is frowning? It's to act behind a mask, to say one thing, but to be something else. Uh, you might want to see... Let's see, Luke 18.9, I think, gives somewhat of a definition to a hypocrite. First, get the girder out of your own eye. Then you can see well enough to get the tiny speck out of your brother's eye. It is interesting to me to note that he says we're going to need to help our brother. He's not saying don't, don't help your brother. Don't come and, and exhort and correct and reprove. We're told to do that in the Scripture. But it's the attitude that we do it that's so crucial. You ought to see Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. I think, I think it's critical at this point. It's the attitude. And let me add a few verses to that that I think will help you. Romans 14, 7 through 10, critical attitude. Yes, we must judge our brothers, but we judge it in the proper way, looking to the Lord and his forgiveness. You also might want to see 1 Corinthians 5, 12, and I think James 4, 11 and 12. Uh, is a very poignant uh, reminder at this point. Now, <clears throat> the next paragraph. You must never give the things that are sacred to dogs, and you must never throw your pearls before hogs. Well, now, who is Jesus referring to as dogs and hogs? Dogs, of course, were the street mongrels, not the little white poodle with uh, pink fingernails. <laughs> uh, there were not pets then. They were not domesticated then. They ran in packs. They ate gross things. It became a synonym for that which is unclean. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, the word dog means a male prostitute. And hogs, of course, were notoriously unclean to the Jews, uh, where they lived, what they ate. So here is two repulsive animals. It's obviously referring to people. Jesus is referring to people by the terms hogs and dogs. Yes, look at the context. He's saying you've got to be critical enough that you're not going to put that which is so meaningful to you before those who aren't going to appreciate it, even worse, turn on you and hurt you. Now, that, that means we must evaluate people. We must evaluate people. Matter of fact, church leaders are called on over and over to evaluate the members of their own congregation for places of responsibility. Isn't that what 1 Timothy 3 is all about? We do not have the choice of spiritually evaluating others. The only choice we have is the standards by which and the attitude in which we're going to do the evaluation. People are evaluating us all the time. We must evaluate them. Now, I think the ideal of pearls, of course, we get the English word marguerite from this. The, the, the name marguerite, arita, comes from this word for pearls. I think it does refer to the gospel message. Others say, no, it can't. But I, I think in context of, of, the, of the Sermon on the Mount, coming to know Christ through the, his teachings, it refers to the teachings of Christ, uniquely the gospel. Uh, let's see. Okay, look at this now, verse 7. See, how does verse 7 relate? Well, quite often it's proof text out of its context and made to relate only to prayer. I think it's important we see that it's related to the judging of our brothers. We must do it, but how do we do it? We best do it in the spiritual preparation of prayer. So this keep on keep seeking, keep on knocking, uh, keep on asking does not have to do with our personal wishes or wants. It has to do in the context of evaluating, spiritually evaluating our fellow Christian. Now, all of these are present imperatives. The Didache, chapter five, verse, 9, verse 5, uses this uh, in making distinctions uh, uh, about the Lord's Supper, this idea of, about that sacred to hogs and dogs. 
And then in verse 7, moves right into the idea of the prayers involved in the Eucharist. Now, what about this keep on knocking, keep on seeking, keep on asking? We've got to balance somehow. We've got to balance somehow faith persistent coming and human effort God's not going to answer me because I come so often he gets tired of me he's not going to give me what I want just because I've asked over and over Jesus asked three times in the garden for the cup to pass and it didn't Paul asked three times for the thorn to be removed and it wasn't you're coming to God over and over if it's not God's will is going to make God give it to you but I think this is saying to me as a pastor, as a counselor, that if anything bothers you, you can bring it to God. And no, no matter how many times it bothers you, you can bring it back to Him. Because really the best thing in prayer is not that we get the circumstances changed or that we get what we ask for, but that we've been with Daddy. Now, notice if you would down in verse 11, he switches this to the context of a, of a parent and child relationship which is often used in the Bible to describe the relationship of God to us. Verse 11 is a first-class conditional. It's assuming we are sinful. Since you, in spite uh, of being bad, know how to give your children what is good, how much more surely will your heavenly Father give what is good to those who keep asking him? Now, the parallel in Luke 11:13 mentions the Holy Spirit here. I don't think this is proven that we have to ask God for the Holy Spirit. This is not talking about spiritual gifts. This is the content of, context of asking for wisdom in relating to dealing with other believers in the area of spiritual evaluation. And the Holy Spirit is a way of talking about God's ultimate gift. Now, notice where it mentions here, this, uh, verse 12. Then you must practice dealing with others as you would like them to deal with you. This is kind of the, the golden rule, I guess. Jesus puts it positively. Many of the rabbis put it negatively. In your notes, I've listed some of the places they are. Uh, I think it's significant that we take ourself seriously and appropriately. I think we need to recognize our sinfulness, but also recognize our great worth because of the value that God has put on us and I think it's important that if we need to love ourselves appropriately so that we can love others appropriately uh, so many people have such a poor self-image that will really hurt how they love God and how they love others and themselves we need to work on that now uh, in verse 13 uh, it talks about go in by the narrow gate uh, for broad and roomy is the road that leads to destruction how is this related well I think we're coming now to talk about the, the Christian life. And there's going, to be, there's going to be two dangers, two ditches. One is a religiosity that, that thinks too much of itself, and the other is a false religiosity uh, that really doesn't know God but sometimes seems so effective. Now, let's watch. This narrow way and broad way, is this saying that knowing God is hard? Oh, I don't think it's saying that. But I do think it's saying that knowing God costs. I always put a relationship on these two. I always say the gospel is absolutely free, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that the gospel costs everything that you are and have, Ephesians 2, 10, uh, the parable of the pearl of great price. We come to him just the way we are, but we dare not leave just the way we've been. Works do not bring us to God, but works are the only way away from God. We come to him by faith, and we leave in faithfulness. And I think we must say that. The road the world thinks gives life and happiness to those who have spiritual discernment. That's what we've been praying for. That's how we judge other people, spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment sees the broad, well-traveled, looks a uh, real good way as death. And spiritual discernment sees the narrow way that looks hard and is seldom traveled is the way of life. It's the will of God. It's hard for us. Now, notice where it mentions that one road leads to destruction. You might well see Matthew 25, 46. There are only two outcomes in life. This is commonly called the two ways. We see it quite often in the scripture, these two ways, um, over and over. Let's see if I, I listed those, see if I can find them. Yeah, here's some of them. 
Uh, Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 and 19. Isaiah 1, 19 and 20. Oh, and Jeremiah 21, 8 really shows the two ways. Now, but narrow is the gate and hard. And the word for hard here comes from the root thelpis, which we get the word persecution or tribulation from. You mean the Christian way is going to be a persecuted way? Yes. Friends, I think you can't read 1 Peter 4, uh, 12 through 18 and come with anything that persecution is the norm for the Christian. Hebrews 5, 8 says that Jesus was perfected by the things that he suffered. God's going to test us, not to destroy us, but to make us strong. It's coming, and the way looks hard when you see it, but it's the way of life. Now, and few there are that find it. You might want to see Luke 13, 23 as a parallel there. I think it's helpful. Uh, this way of persecution is just the, uh, the very opposite of Matthew 11, 29 and 30. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Well, this is the other side of the, of the coin, which is count the cost. Count the cost, fella. If you start this path, stay on this path. Uh, count the cost. Sometimes I think we preach an easy believism when the truth is the Bible speaks of discipleship and fellowship, not just decision. It's not just making an emotional response. It's a lifestyle commitment for the will of God, whatever that is. Now, beginning in verse 15, we move to the false prophets. This is also a problem that Christians are going to face on this narrow way. Not only persecution, but false teaching. Look out, another present imperative, for false prophets, pseudo-prophetes. Now, these, so how do you know a false prophet? Well, Jesus mentioned false prophets quite often. Uh, Matthew 24, 4 and 5, Matthew 24, 11, Matthew 24, 23 and 24, Mark 13, 22. Is he talking about Pharisees and Sadducees? Yes. He's talking about Gnostics and Judaizers? Yes. He's talking about modern cult groups? Yes. You say, well, Bob, how do you know a false teacher? Well, this whole thing is going to say by their fruits you're going to know them. Now, what are fruits, teaching or lifestyle? Well, I'll get into that in just a minute, but I want to say a word about are there some biblical guidelines that you can know who speaks the truth? I've done a tape on that called How Do You Know Who Speaks the Truth, which I developed this in about a 45-minute sermon. Let me give you the brief outline quickly. You need to go first to Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 3, and Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. We must speak in God's name, and if it's a prediction involved, it must come true every time. There may even be the miraculous involved, but if, if, if it's a name of another God, it's not God's. Also, I think we must say that the actions of the person are critical. Titus 1:16. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Our, our, our motives and our actions are going to show who we are. And finally, our theology is crucial. 1 John 4, 1 through 3 says, our message must be Jesus-centered, and he must be fully God and fully man. The gospel is the center pillar of judging between those who are false prophets and those who are true prophets. Some people you're not going to like because of their emphasis. Some people you're not going to like because of their personality type. Some people you're not going to like because of some kind of personal idiosyncrasy or doctrinal idiosyncrasy. But the way you tell the, the true proclaimers of God is their message about Jesus and their lifestyle. Now, who come to you under the guise of sheep? They look like Christians. They come from within. But inside they are ravenous wolves, the sheep's worst destructive enemy. You must recognize them, epigonosco. You must have full knowledge of them, he says. That's just, you ought to read 1 John 4. You've got to test the spirits, brother, because the sharpest people I know are cult leaders. Recognize them by their fruits. And I would say here their words, their teachings, and their lifestyle. People do not pick grapes from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, do they? So any healthy tree bears good fruit, and a sickly tree bears poor fruit. A healthy tree cannot produce poor fruit, and a sickly tree cannot produce good fruit. This is not saying that Christians won't have sin in their life. We're all going to have some degree of sin, but repentance will accompany it. There'll be contrition. Now look at verse 20. You must recognize them by their fruits. Now, I'm going to put two categories, teachings and actions. Now, for teachings, you ought to see 1 John 4, 1 through 3, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, Deuteronomy 18, 22. But now for their lifestyles. Please write these down. I think it'll be very helpful in judging how do you know who speaks the truth. Luke 3, 8 through 14. 
John 15, 8 through 10, Ephesians 5, 9 through 12, Colossians 1, 10, James 3, 17 and 18, Titus 1, 16, and 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Crucial passages about love, and I think I could add so supremely there, 1 Corinthians 13. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who practice doing the will of my Father who is in heaven. These are some of the hardest words that I ever re have read in the Bible. For here somebody seems to be saying the very uh, essence of our faith, which is the theological understanding of Jesus Christ as being fully God and fully man. The word Lord or Kyrios was often used as a way of substituting for the name Yahweh in the Old Testament. It came to have the idea of deity. That's why we translate the word Yahweh by the word Lord in our English Bibles. So here, this, this word can simply mean sir or mister, or it can have the full theological impact of fully God and fully man. These people seem to be calling God by his exalted theological title. And they, it's duplicated in the Old Testament when they said Abraham, Abraham, or Jacob, Jacob. You see in your notes where they did that. The rabbis say it's a sign of intense affection. These people seem to, by their, their, their reduplication of the, of the theological term for uh, uh, Lord, seem to show they're, they're, they're excited about the relationship. Notice this. Not only do they call him Lord, Lord, but look what they do. Look at verse 22. They, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did many mighty miracles. And Jesus said, I never knew you. You mean these men were successful ministers? Their ministries were confirmed by the miraculous, by people being saved, people being delivered. Oh, yes, friend, don't you know that? You see, they were using Jesus' name. Three times it says it in here. But they didn't know him. Uh, you can know about Jesus. You can use his name. You can say it and not know him. Knowing him, the relationship is where salvation comes. And then once, once you know him, then you're going to live and serve for him. You mean there really are false teachers that look effective? Oh, yes. Yes. How do you know them? By their theology and by their lifestyle. Now, the kingdom of heaven is Matthew's way of referring to the same thing that Mark and Luke call the kingdom of God. It's the reign of God in men's hearts now. In some passages like this, it looks future. It'll happen, way, it'll happen out there. But in others, like earlier in Matthew, Matthew 3, 2, it looks right here. I usually say the kingdom of God is God's reign in men's hearts now that will one day be consummated over all the earth. Notice it says those who says, present tense, they say this, but they don't practice and they practice doing something. They don't practice doing what God says. Look down in verse 24. Everyone who listens to my words and practices these teachings. Look down at 26. And anyone who listens to my words and does not practice. This is just like the theological emphasis. James, don't be hearers only, be doers. It's like the Hebrew word Shema of Deuteronomy 6. It means to hear and to do. These men had a head knowledge of God. They even had some field experience of ministry. But what they knew, they didn't live. Oh, God, help us. Does that happen in our day? Oh, my. Notice Jesus says, uh, practice doing the will of my Father. What is the will of my Father? Ministry? Oh, no. The will of God is that we trust Jesus Christ. John 6, 29. John 6, 39 and 40. Uh, Ezekiel 18, 28. 1 Timothy 2, 4. 2 Peter 3, 9. God loves all men. It wants all men to be saved. That's the essence of this. Salvation is the key. And then once we know him, then lifestyle faith becomes important. But I tell you what, religious actions, religiosity, uh, ministry, when that's placed in front of salvation, it often becomes a self-righteous barrier instead of a sturdy bridge to the Father. Now, I will say to them openly in verse 23, openly, openly, this is the word profess or confess. He'll say before everybody, I never knew you. Very strong term. I never knew you at all. Oh, my. Jesus says, I never knew you, but they were active, successful ministers. Yes. Jesus talks about the idea. You, we can't trust in the miraculous as a sign. Look at Matthew 24, 24. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. Miracle or success can't be the mark of God. 
It's counterfeited too much by the evil one. What is the mark of God? Love, peace, joy, patience, long-suffering, self-control. That's the mark of our God. Oh, 1 Corinthians 13 is to the heart. You can do everything right, but it's not done in love. It's not from him. And notice that these two ways again comes back. These two ways return again. They're put down in verses 24 down through the, through the very end, 27. One builds his house. The houses look just alike, don't they? They both look just alike. What, what makes the difference? The rains fall. Biblically speaking, I would say persecution, trials, pressure come, like the parable of the soil. And though many responded initially, only the, parable, only the soil that bore fruit was the truly saved. Two other soils germinated. It says they received the word with joy, but they didn't bear fruit. They weren't truly Christians. It's the persecution that shows who we really are. It's the narrow road. It's, it's the times of pressure where the real us comes out. On the times of pressure will come. They came in the life of every child of God in the biblical time. They'll come in ours and we'll know if we're really his. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So these houses look right, but persecution revealed. And look at verse 28 and 29. They were shocked by this kind of teaching. Now, when Jesus had closed his address, this is a characteristic phrase of Matthew 11, 1, 13, 53, 19, 1, 26, 1. The people were astonished because he didn't quote other people like the rabbis did. He didn't base his authority on what somebody said. He based it himself. He's showing he's the Messiah in rather an unveiled way. Knowing Jesus becomes the key, not knowing theology. Uh, knowing Jesus becomes the key, not doing ministry, not being religious, not being self-righteous. Knowing him, and with this he ends the sermon.